Hello everyone, how's it going? It's Quinton here and welcome to this tutorial series on React. Now, if you're watching this video, then I'm gonna assume that most of you have already heard of React in some way in the past because React is one of the most popular JavaScript libraries out there. And of course, it's also built by Facebook. So this is an open source project by Facebook on GitHub. And that just means that React is incredibly popular and used by a lot of companies out there. So if you are trying to make it as a web developer or even as a mobile developer, then React is a very good skill to add to your skill set because you've got React and React Native for mobile development. So now that we know what React is, let's just talk about a couple of things you're gonna to need to know before you can actually get started learning React. And of course, one of the most obvious things you're going to need to know is JavaScript because React is a JavaScript library. If you don't already know some of the basics of JavaScript, then a lot of what we're doing in this tutorial series is gonna go way over your head. So make sure to watch my videos on JavaScript first, and then you can come back and watch the videos on React. The next thing you're going to need is you're gonna to need to be a little bit comfortable working with the terminal. So I do have some videos explaining how to work with the terminal in Mac and also how to customize the terminal in Mac just to make it slightly more comfortable for you. But you really need to know how to navigate your way around your computer because a lot of what we do when coding in React is going to involve running some commands from the command line. And if you don't already know how to do that, you need to go back and learn that first. Right, so now that we know how to work with the terminal, the next thing we wanna do is also install Node.js onto our computer if it isn't already installed because Node is of course standard for any JavaScript development environment and especially for React because React is basically just an NPM package or a Node package, right? So let's go back over to the terminal and I'm gonna type in Node-V and that'll tell me what version of Node I have on my computer, which in this case happens to be 13.7. If this command doesn't work, it means that you don't have Node on your computer. The next thing we wanna do is also install Yarn, which is a package manager. This is basically just an alternative to NPM. And what I'm gonna do is just type in yarn-v to show you what version I have of Yarn installed on my computer because I'm gonna be running mostly yarn commands and not NPM commands in my tutorial series. So just make sure that you install that. And the last thing we need to install on our computer is actually just a browser extension for Google Chrome. And this is called React Developer Tools. So make sure to install that because what this is gonna allow you to do is inspect your components and help debug your React application. So make sure to install this. And once you have this browser extension installed, the next thing you wanna do is finally start creating your React application. And we're gonna do this using the Create React App tool. And what this does under the hood is just sets up your Webpack setup, your Babel setup, your ESLint setup. So it takes care of all of the difficult dev environment things for you. And all you need to do is run one command to set up the uh, uh, project for yourself. So let's copy that command and paste that into the terminal. And I'm just gonna change the name of this from my app to learning React. And this is going to use npx, which is Node's package runner to run the create app package and make a package called learning React. So let's hit enter. And once that entire process is finished running, you'll have a nice little message in the terminal here that explains what just happened. So we've created the entire application. We've also set this up uh, and created a git commit. So this is already ready to push up to GitHub. And we've also got a few commands that have been set up to help us start developing our project. So we've got yarn start, which will start the dev server, yarn build to build the production version of our site. Um, we've also got some testing commands and we've got uh, a command to eject from 
uh, the current Webpack build, but we're probably not gonna wanna do that, especially since we're very new to React. So instead, let's just go with what they suggest we do here, and that is to CD into the directory. So let's CD into learning React. And then I'm going to also type in yarn start to start the dev server. And you can see that this has already been set up as a, a Git repository or a Git project. And so what that's done for us is it's opened up our React application, the one that we just created, and it's running it on a local development server, which is localhost port 3000. And it's even given us a little instruction here to say, you should edit source app.js to edit this app. So let's actually open this up in a code editor. So I'm gonna go back over to my terminal and what I wanna do is I don't want to kill this terminal window because if I do, I'm gonna kill the entire dev server and we're gonna to have to start this up again. So instead, let's open up a new tab in the terminal and I'm gonna CD into the React tutorials directory and then I'm going to also open up learning React. And uh, now what I wanna do is open this up in my editor. So I'm gonna type in code dot slash. And if you have Visual Studio Code on your computer, this will open up the project in Visual Studio Code. So let's hit enter and wait for the IDE to open. And these are all of the projects. Whoops, let's just close that update. Um, but these are all of the files in our project. So here we have uh, package JSON and a readme file. So if you wanna do a little bit of reading up on what's actually going on here, you could probably uh, read through this. And if we open up source and app.js, this is the actual app that's in the browser. So you can see we've got the same text here, edit source app.js and save to reload. So what I wanna do just to demonstrate that this has hot reloading is let's just pull the IDE like this and let's pull the browser to the side as well. Just pull that over there. And now if we make any changes, so let's maybe add in a new paragraph over here and hit save you can see that without me even having to refresh, uh, the browser hot reloads with all of our changes set up and visible. So now we have our app open in the browser and we already know that if we make changes to this and save, that those changes are going to be automatically displayed in the browser. But let's take a deeper look at what's really going on over here. So there's a lot of things that are working together under the hood to make this happen. Now, of course, app.js has been highlighted as one of the first files to take a look at. So let's look at this file and then work our way backwards to figure out how all of this works. So taking a look at app.js, we actually have a React components. So React is made out of these things called components and our parent level component for our app is actually going to be this app component over here. So what this function is actually doing is, I know it looks like a function called app. What it's actually doing is creating a, a stateless component in React and then it's returning what looks like HTML except there is a slight difference here because this isn't actually HTML, it's something called JSX. And what JSX allows you to do is output JavaScript variables or uh, perform JavaScript logic in the code using these curly braces. So you're gonna see a lot of those quite often when working with React. The next difference you'll see is that we also have class name instead of class. So whenever you want to apply a class to uh, one of these elements, you have to use the class name attribute instead of class. Great, so that's what's going on over here. Uh, what's going on at the top here are JavaScript imports. So you're gonna see this quite a lot when working with components, is that you might want to import code from another file, and this is something that is new to JavaScript in ES6. So it's actually been around for quite some time and some of you may have already been using JavaScript imports in the past, but some of you might not know this. Um, 
So JavaScript imports, whenever you re, uh, import a file that doesn't have a relative file path, then JavaScript is automatically gonna assume that this must be a package. And so this must be located in the node modules folder. Now, of course, you're never going to edit any package files. So you just need to know that React is a package and it's located in the node modules folder over there. We're not going to worry about finding it. Then the next two imports over here actually have relative file paths. So dot slash means that this file, logo.svg, must be in the same directory as app JS because that's the file that's actually using it, right? So if we take a look at app.js, that's in the source directory and we've also got logo SVG in the source directory. So dot slash just means look in the same directory. Now, if you're not familiar with file paths, you might wanna make yourself familiar because you're also gonna be using things like dot dot slash to go back a folder and so on, right? So uh, logo.svg is just importing this logo and app CSS is of course importing the app CSS into this file and we're using the classes from app CSS over here and then we're also importing this logo so that we can use it as the source for this image and that's actually what's got the react logo spinning over here. Now down at the bottom of the file we're also making use of an export and that's a very good sign to show you that this isn't the entry point into our app, this is actually just a component and this is being used by another file. So if we take a look at index.js, that is typically the main point of entry into any JavaScript app. So let's open that up. And you can see that over here, we're also making use of the React library and the React DOM. And we've also got some CSS files over here. But most importantly, we have imported app from app. So we've actually imported this app into the index file and we're making use of that over here. And what we're doing is we're actually binding the React, our React app to the uh, document element and we're actually looking for an element with an ID of root. So where is this element located? Well, that's actually in this index.html file. So if we open that up, this is the uh, HTML file that is going to be shipped to the client whenever they visit our website. And so what our JavaScript is doing over here is it's looking for this div with an ID of root and it's binding our entire JavaScript application to this div. And then from there, we are conditionally rendering out all of our components uh, firstly, our app component and our app component can then render out the rest of our other components. So we can have components inside of components and that's what we are gonna be doing in the next few videos. Now let's take a look at creating our own React components because as I said before, everything in React is a component. So fortunately, we've already got a very good example of what a component should look like if we take a look at app.js. So this is a React component, and this is actually a stateless React component, and that's because it's using a function. So this is also called a functional component. Now let's take a look at some of the errors that you might encounter when first working with a component. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just get rid of everything in the app component, and I'm gonna hit save, and you'll see that we now have a passing error unexpected token. And that's because whenever you create a component in React, that always has to return one wrapper element. So if I put in a div here and I save, you can see we get rid of that error. Now, of course, if you ever wanted to return multiple components, you're also gonna get an error, or multiple elements rather, you're also gonna get an error. So let's save. And now you can see that we've got a passing error. Uh, so JSX should always be wrapped in one enclosing tag. So basically, if you ever want to create a component that's gonna return multiple elements, they should all be wrapped in a parent element. So this could be a header, this could be a div, this could be a nav, this could be whatever you like. Uh, but you should always have one wrapper element and then all your other elements inside of that. And you can see that that gets rid of the error. But let's go back to a simple div. So I'm just gonna add in a div again. And let's get rid of that logo import. And let's take a look at creating our own component. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a component that will return 
the user's name. So we'll say something like a hello world component. So in the source directory, I'm gonna create a new folder and let's call that folder components. And inside of the components folder, I'm gonna create a new file and we can call that hello world.js. So whenever you create a new component in React, its default naming convention is to always uh, name your components with a capital letter. And in this case, because it's multi-word, it's capital letter with uh, camel caps. Okay, so let's hit enter. And now we've got our hello world file. The first thing we wanna do is import React from React. Now that we've got React imported, we can declare our components. And there are two different syntaxes for this. So the first is a stateless component, and then the second is a component that is using ES6 uh, class syntax. So let's take a look at the first syntax, which is the stateless component or the functional component. And that is the same as our app.js file over here. So we'll create a function. We'll call this hello world, open up our parentheses, open up our curly braces, and then that can return something. So let's just return an h1, and this can say, hello, Quinton. So we'll hard code the name in there for now. The next thing we need to do is obviously export that. So we'll go export default, hello world. And now we can head over to app.js, and in order to make use of that component, all we need to do is import that at the top of the file over here. So import hello world from dot slash components and hello world. So make sure to get your file path correct. And now that we've done that, we can use our component as an element. So basically like that. And I'm gonna use it as a single tag. So just hello world. Now if I hit save, you can see we've got an H1 returned as hello Quinton. So if you wanted to make this a little bit more dynamic, you can make use of props. So props in React are just a way to pass information from one component to another. So I'm gonna add in a prop of name and we can set this equal to Jared. And now that I've done this, I can make use of this prop in my hello world component by first accepting props as an argument. And then in my JSX, I'll open up some curly braces and we'll access the name property of this prop object or props object. And now when we save this, you can see, whoops, we don't actually have anything going on here. So let's take a look at this and let's just make sure I save this. Uh, so app.js wasn't saved. And now we've got hello Jared returned in the browser. And of course, whenever you change this name, then the output in the browser will change as well. So that's how you pass information from one component to another component. You'll be using props. Now let's take a look at declaring a component using the class-based syntax. So I'm gonna head back over to the hello world JS file and let's completely remove this function. And instead of using a function, I'm going to create a class and we're gonna call this class hello world because that's what we're exporting down here. And this is going to extend react.component. So that's why we import react at the top of our file here. Then the next thing we wanna do is add in a render function because this class should return a render function when we are gonna be returning some JSX. And this render function should have a return statement and this return statement can return our H1 along with hello and then the prop name that we wanna say hello to. So the way we access our prop when using a class-based syntax is a little bit different. Before we used to access it with props.name and you'll see that my IDE has automatically corrected this for me because we are using the class-based syntax here. So we have to access our props with the this keyword. So this props dot, uh, dot name and that will have the exact same output. So if I come back here and maybe change that name back to Quinton, you can see we still have hello Quinton output in the browser. Those are the differences between those two syntaxes. You're gonna see 
both of them in documentation, but you're gonna see that's those differences in syntax wherever you look in documentation. And that is all I have for you in this video. In this tutorial, we are going to take a look at creating a simple app that can increase and decrease the value of a variable in state. But before I get started, I just want to mention that there are currently two different ways to do this in React. So there is a hook based approach and then there is a uh, class based approach. So if you take a look at React's documentation, this would be the hook based approach, which is a functional component that makes use of the use state hook. And then there is a class based approach that makes use of uh, state up here in the constructor of the class. So the reason why there are two different approaches to this is because hooks are actually new to React. They've been around since about 2018. Uh, and what they do is they just replace some of the features that were previously only available to React in a class. So because there are two different ways of doing things, which way is right? Well, the better way to do things is to do it using a hook. And that's because React sort of in this transitional phase at the moment where they're trying to phase out uh, classes and phase into hooks. So all new code should be written as a hook. So now let's take a look at using a hook to store a value in state. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file and we'll call this counter example.js. And I'm gonna paste in some standard React boilerplate. We're just importing React from React and declaring a functional component. Now, if I save this and I go back over to app.js, I should be able to import that in and we can probably just comment out hello world for now as well. So we've got a blank document over here. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, storing va a value in state. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a constant and I'm gonna open up an array and this array is gonna take in two values. The first value is the name of the variable that we wanna create, in this case it's count. And the second value is just a name of a function that we wanna use to set the value of this variable later on. So in this case, let's go with set count. And so that's kind of the standard naming convention is your second function is always just gonna be a setter for that variable. And now we set that equal to a function and the function is called use state. And actually let's just uh, do it this way so that I can make sure that I import that with React. So this is a React function that we're gonna be making use of. And this function takes in one argument and that argument is the value that we want to store in state. So in this case, let's start off with the value of zero. So I know that this does look a little bit complicated, especially coming from a JavaScript side of things. Why would you be storing your variables like this as an array? It probably makes a lot more sense if you just copy that and actually console.log it. So let's actually console.log use state. And I think for now, let's actually just comment that out. Uh, but if we inspect element now and we go over to the console, you can see what's actually being logged here is an array with a value of zero and then a function. So that's actually what's being returned and that's why we go about creating that variable in such a weird way. But now we should have a value stored in state of zero. And hopefully you've installed React Developer Tools because this is a great time to make use of that. So if we go over to our dev tools here, you can see that I've got components that I can inspect and I can take a look at the counter example. And here in hooks, I've got a state with a value of zero. Of course, if I were to change this value to 10, then I should have a value of 10 stored in state. But let's start off with zero, right? So now what I wanna do is just output that count down here. And I think we can do that in an H1 just so that it's nice and big. And I'll open up some curly braces and display that count in the browser. So I've got the value of zero output over here. The next thing I wanna do is create something to click on so we can set that count. So what I'm gonna do is create another H1. And the only reason I'm doing this is just so that these 
uh, elements are nice and big to click on. And also I don't really have any CSS to style these just yet. So what I wanna do is I'm going to just uh, add in the text plus, and then I'm going to add in an on-click uh, listener over here. And this is going to be set to some JavaScript. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna use an arrow function. So this is just kind of the standard syntax for this. Um, but we use an arrow function and then we call the setter that we declared above and then we provide this setter with a value. So in this case, if I wanted the plus button to increase our uh, counter over here by one, then I would add count and plus one. So that's going to use the current count plus one. So if we save this now and go back over the browser and we click plus, that increases our counter every time we click on the word plus. Now let's take a look at building a basic app layout with a menu that opens and closes. And before I get started, I just wanna mention that all of the code for this tutorial will be available in my GitHub. So take a look at the video description below for a link to the repository. And now let's just jump straight into it. So starting with the code from the previous tutorial, the first thing I wanna do is create a header component at the top of our app. So let's go over to components and we'll create a new file and we can call that header.js. And inside of that, of course, we want to import React from React. So we can make use of our functional component and we're gonna create a new function here. We'll call this header and this is going to return some JSX. So for now, let's just return a header with the name of our app. So in this case, I'm just going to say app name. Now we can make that the default export. So default header. And the next thing we wanna do is just import that into our main app. So I'm gonna duplicate this line down and we can change the name here to header and the file to header. And now if I place in our header component, we should have our app header on the page. Now what I probably wanna do is style this. And there's a bunch of different ways we could go about doing this because we could go the conventional way of just writing our own CSS. And if I was gonna do that, you can see that we're already importing a file called app CSS over here. So if I open that up, here we've got some CSS and I could probably just remove all of this because this is what shipped with the original NPX installation. And we can replace that with our own CSS. So if I wanted to, I could create a app header and then just take the CSS class and paste that onto my header as a class name. And of course, there we have a styled header. So that's the conventional CSS approach if that's the approach that you'd like to follow. But I think I'd like to make use of a CSS framework and the CSS framework that I really like using is Tailwind CSS. So this is JavaScript configurable CSS and since we're building a JavaScript app, it's obviously really nice to have CSS that's also configurable with JavaScript. So let's take a look at the getting started page. And this takes us straight to the installation step. So this is actually four steps to install, which is fairly simple. So what we wanna do is of course, yarn add tailwind CSS. So I'm gonna go over to the command line and we can paste that command in here. And of course that is going to install tailwind into our project. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with NPM packages, if you take a look at package JSON now, we should have Tailwind CSS added to our package JSON file. The next thing we wanna do is also add in the Tailwind CSS into our app. So I think what I'm gonna do here is just get rid of the app CSS file that we've just edited. So let's just delete that entirely. And you can see that we've got another index CSS file here and that's actually imported into the main index uh, file of our app. So I think we'll make use of this index file. Uh, so what we can do here is just get rid of all the CSS that's in here and we'll paste in our Tailwind CSS. And we'll 
land up using this CSS file to generate the rest of our Tailwind CSS. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you right now, don't worry, we're going to do that in the next step. So what we wanna do first is create a Tailwind config file. So let's go back over to the terminal and we will run that npx command. And so what this has done is it's created a Tailwind config file. So if we wanna take a look at that, that should be added to our project down here. And this is where we will eventually start defining any of our own custom classes that don't ship with Tailwind. But for now, I think we can just leave that file as it is so we can forget about it. I'm just gonna close that. And the last step that we really need to uh, do here is to process our CSS. So we need to some way of processing these three lines into actual usable CSS. And we're gonna do that with uh, post CSS. So what I'm gonna do is copy this code and you can see that it says we need to put this code in a post CSS config file. So let's create that file. And we can paste that code in here. Of course, maybe just get rid of these comments. So we're making use of post CSS or a post CSS config file, and this will automatically be picked up by our project whenever we run a post CSS command. But if we take a look at package JSON, package or post CSS is not a package in our project at the moment. So what we wanna do is also just run yarn add post CSS dash CLI, and that is going to install post CSS as one of the packages. So taking a look at package JSON now, we should have post CSS added to our project. The last thing I'm gonna do just for good measure is to also install auto prefixer because that is a requirement by Tailwind. So let's go back over to the command line and yarn add auto prefixer. So now that we have all of the necessary packages, the next thing we wanna do is add in a script that will build our CSS. So what I'm gonna do is just paste in these two lines. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna run a post CSS command that will take the source index file, which is this file, and then create an app CSS file. And in fact, we could probably call this Tailwind CSS. And so now if I uh, run the build CSS command in my terminal, so let's just jump back here and run yarn build CSS. That should generate a Tailwind CSS file for me. So let's go back over to my project. And there we go. We now have a Tailwind CSS file that didn't exist before. And so if we open this up, you can see that there's a lot of CSS that's been generated for us, but that has all been generated and configured using JavaScript, using Tailwind's uh, defaults and then some of our config. So what we probably wanna do is whenever we start our app, we also just wanna make sure that we build our project as well. So what I'm gonna do is maybe just replace the start and build lines with this code. Uh, and what this is gonna do is just make sure that we build our CSS whenever we run the yarn start or yarn build command. So if I come back over to the terminal, uh, you can see that we, well, let's just kill this app and then run yarn start again. Uh, what this should do is first build our CSS and then start our React scripts. And that's basically what just happened. So hopefully we don't have any errors. Oops, uh, okay, we cannot find the app CSS file, of course. So if we go back to app CSS, you can see that we're importing that here, but I deleted that file, it no longer exists, so we don't need that anymore. And then I guess the last thing we really need to do as you can see, we've got some default text here, Times New Roman text. The last thing we need to do is in our index.js file, replace the index CSS with Tailwind CSS, because we wanna make sure that we're using the newly generated CSS file. And now you can see that uh, Tailwind should have been imported into our project, and we can see that by the font changing, but if I wanted to, I could go back over to my header now and start testing this out with some Tailwind classes. So Tailwind has a class called border B for border bottom. And now we should have a border on the bottom of our site. We can also set this to have a class of font bold. 
And now we've got bold text and P3 will create some padding around our header. Perfect. Now, just in case you're wondering, these classes can all be found in Tailwind's documentation. So if you go over to Tailwind's website and search for something like border, then you can look at border width and we have a border B, which will give us a one pixel border on the bottom of our site. The same thing for all the other classes. So font weight, uh, we have font bold, which will make our font uh, have a weight of 700, etc. So now that we have a header, let's take a look at creating a footer for our website. So I'm going to create a new component here and we can call this footer.js. And of course, I'm just going to use the same code that's in our header and we'll just change this up a little bit. Copyright 2020. And now we can probably just add some classes to style this. But before we do that, let's actually import that into our app. So we can duplicate that line down and change this to footer and footer and then pull our footer in here. Great, so we've got the copyright there. I think let's just focus on doing some styling. So we'll say BG gray 200 text center and text XS and P3 just to make it a little bit smaller. Great. I think the last thing I want to do with this footer is maybe position that all the way at the bottom of the document. So I'm going to add in a class of absolute and bottom zero. And that should throw it all the way down to the bottom of our document. I guess the last thing we should probably do is just give that a class of W full. So that is the full width. Great, so we've got the start of what looks like a good app. In the next video, we'll take a look at creating the rest of the layout and also creating our navigation menu. But for now, that's all I have for you in this video. Now let's take a look at creating the animated menu. But before we get started, I just want to advise you that you should be using the React Developer Tools. So that should be installed in Google Chrome. And with that installed, you can now inspect what components are currently on your page. For example, the header component or the Hello World component. And you'll also be able to see what props they have, what state they currently have set. And that's going to be very useful for debugging during this tutorial because we are going to be making use of a component that has state. So what I'm going to do is go over to my components directory and let's create a new file and we'll call this navigation.js. And this is going to be fairly similar to our header component for now. So let's just import that code over here or copy paste that code over here. And we can change the function name to navigation and we'll just export navigation. And this is going to return a nav item. And for now, let's just return the nav so that we can get some styling right. And so I'm going to go over to our header component here and I'm actually going to import the navigation into this header component. So let's import navigation from dot slash navigation. And then we just want to make use of that down here. So navigation. And so now we can see that we've got the nav appearing over here. Uh, let's take a look at styling this. So what I want to do is maybe get rid of the font bold class and we can actually just create a span tag down here with the font bold class. And so now what I would like to do is take the nav and put it in the top corner. So what I'm going to do is turn this into a flex box and then I'm going to justify the uh, items between. And then I'm also just going to add in items center, which should horizontally center them if this ever gets uh, bigger than the other one. Right. So now we've got our navigation. The next thing we want to do is instead of using a word, the nav, let's take a look at replacing this with an icon. So I'm going to make use of font awesome and they have a pretty good package for react. So you can see that they recommend that down here in their docs. So if you click on that link, that's going to take you to font awesomes, uh, GitHub page. 
And if you scroll down to the installation section, you can see that you can imp uh, install this package using either npm or yarn and it's actually three separate packages that we have to install so what I'm going to do is install all three of those with this command over here so now that we have these packages installed the next thing we want to do is actually make use of that so we need to import the font awesome icon And then we also need to import the specific icon that we want to use. In this case, I want to use the FA bars icon. So I'm just going to change this to FA bars and also just change the package to free solid icons. So now we have uh, the icon component and then we also have the JavaScript icon that we want to use. Uh, so what we want to do is add this in as a component, font awesome icon. And then this needs to take in a prop of icon and that icon needs to be the FA bars icon. So we're just going to put that in there. And so now we've got uh, three little horizontal bars. The next thing I want to do is maybe just increase the size of that a little bit. So now we've got an icon. The next thing I want to do is whenever I click on this icon, I want to open and close the menu. So we need to be making use of state. So I can give this navigation some states by making use of a React hook. So let's create a React hook over here. And this is going to be the show menu, or this is going to be a variable called show menu. And I'm going to use a method called set show menu whenever I want to change what's in that variable. And then we'll use the use state hook and I'm going to add in the word false over here. So what this is doing is it's creating a variable called show menu, which is going to be our state to check whether we should show the menu. Then we're also declaring that we're going to use a uh, function or a method over here that is going to change the value of this variable. And then we are just using the use state hook from React. And we're setting this to have a current value of false. So our menu should always load in closed. And now if we take a look at our navigation component in React DevTools, you can see that we've got a hook over here with a state of false. So that's where that value got applied. Of course, if we set this to true, then that would change the value down here in state. But we're going to use the value of true to determine whether the menu should be open or not. So by default, it should be false. The menu should be closed. And then when we click on this icon, so let's go on click of this icon. What we want to do here is use an arrow function to change the value of show menu. So we're going to be using the set show menu uh, method here and we're going to pass this a value of true for now. And so now our app loads in with state as false, but when we click the icon, uh, then state turns into true. Uh, so I'm not sure if maybe I should make that just a little bit bigger so we can see that. Uh, but now state has a value of true. So what we could also do just to make this value toggle is we can set this to the opposite of show menu. And so that means whenever I click on this button, it should alternate the value. So we've got true and then false and then true and then false whenever I click on it. Great. So that should toggle our menu open and closed. So what I want to do now is add in some HTML to display when that value is true. This is called conditional rendering in React, when we want to show a little bit of HTML, but only when a certain value is true. So what I want to do here is create a new variable, and we can set this equal to some JSX, like uh, this is the menu, right? And now, uh, if I were to output that variable at the bottom of my navigation, so 
way my navigation should be, we now have this is the menu output, but we only want this displaying when the menu is actually open. So when state is equal to true. So what I'd like to do is let's start off by initializing this variable, but as a null value. And that means that the menu won't be showing, but then I can create an if statement here and I can check if show menu is equal to true. And if it is equal to true, true, then I'd like to give this menu variable a value. And this can be a div with uh, the menu, right? And so now when I open the menu, we have the menu. And when I close the menu, we don't have the menu displaying anymore. So that is how you very simply conditionally render stuff in react. The next thing I want to do is probably just give this menu some styling. So I'm going to use some more tailwind CSS classes here. And I'm going to give this a position of fixed and a BG of white for a white background. And then I'm also going to position it top zero, which should position it at the top of our browser. And then I'm also going to say left zero. So it'll be in the top left corner. And then we'll say W a W4-5 should be 80%. And so now if I come back over to uh, the browser over here and I open my menu, now we've got our menu open and closing in the top corner. Of course, I also just want to give this another class of H full. And when our menu is open, it should take up the full width of uh, our page. And you can see it's not quite taking up the full width and that's because the footer is positioned absolutely. Uh, so what we want to do is maybe just give this a Z index of 50 to bring that up uh, a little bit. And so now our menu is actually displayed on top of our footer. We probably just want to give this a uh, shadow as well. So there's a class called shadow in Tailwind and that's just given it a slight shadow along the uh, side over there. Great. So now we've got a menu item or a menu component that's basically popping in and out. Uh, the next thing I want to do is probably just give this a little bit of a menu mask or a menu overlay uh, just to separate our menu from the background because right now it's white on white and that's not very visible. So what I'm going to do is also create a menu mask and then we will uh, give that menu mask a value as well. And this menu mask will be another div. And this is just going to be an empty div, but it will also have a class of BG black, and it'll also be fixed. And it will also be in the top left corner. So top zero, left zero. And this is going to be W full and H full and Z 50. And so now when we open up our menu, uh, oh, oops, we need to make sure that we also display that here. And it's going to have to be above the menu. Okay, so now when we open up our menu, we've got a black background, and then we've also got our menu. Uh, of course, it would be much better if this background was slightly transparent. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to add in our own color to Tailwind CSS. So I'm going to go over to Tailwind and I'm just going to go to theme extend and I'm going to extend the background colors. And I'm going to add in a background color of black T for black transparent 50 for 50%. And then we'll give this an RGB value, RGBA of 0, 0, 0, and then a comma 0.5 for a 50% transparency. And so now, in order to make use of this color, I'm going to go back over to my navigation and we'll add in that class, BG Black T50. But I'm going to have to rebuild my CSS. So I'm going to go back over to the command line here and I'm just going to run yarn build CSS. And that should build the CSS. And so now if I come back over to my app, 
uh, I have a slightly transparent black color here. And now what I'd like to do is when I click on this black, it should close my menu. So what I wanna do is add in an on-click listener. And we're going to also set this to an arrow function. And this arrow function is also going to set show menu, but it's always going to provide the value of false. So that means it should always make sure that the menu is closed whenever you click on it. So if we open the menu now and then click on the black background, you can see that that closes the menu. Of course, if I open the menu and click within the white part of our menu, that isn't closing the menu. So now we have a menu that's opening and closing. In the next video, we're gonna take a look at doing the animations. Now let's take a look at making that menu animate in and out smoothly. And before I get started, I just wanna mention that all of the code for this tutorial series can be found on my GitHub page, so please, Take a look at the video description below for a link to my YouTube channel, uh, to my GitHub profile. And now let's just jump straight into the tutorial. So in order to make smooth transitions, I'm gonna be making use of a package for React called React Spring. And if we scroll down and take a look at the use transition API, you can see that there's a bunch of cool little transitions that we'll be able to use like this, uh, peace sign fading in and out. And this is actually what we're most interested in at the moment because this is the example for mounting and unmounting single component reveals, which is exactly what our menu is. It's one component that's mounting in and mounting out. And by the way, there's a bunch of other examples down here if you wanna take a look at what uh, React Spring is capable of. But for now, let's take a look at how to use this. So what we're gonna do is copy this import and we're gonna paste that into the top of our component. And of course, when I save this, it should break our app. And that's because I need to add React Spring to our project with Yarn Add. So let's go back over to uh, my terminal and I'm going to Yarn Add React Spring. And of course that should install it for me. So now I have Spring in my project, the next thing I wanna do is start making use of it. But I think before I do that, I'm going to just make, I'm gonna save these classes somewhere. So we have the uh, menu classes that I have put there, and then I'm also going to put the uh, mask classes here as well. And that's, I'm just saving for later. But now what I can do is get rid of all of our current uh, HTML involved for the menu and the mask. And then we can also get rid of this. And so we've almost got a fresh component that does almost nothing anymore. But what we wanna do is look at the, inst uh, the installation of this component here. So you can see that they start off by creating a state variable and we've already got that state variable here, so I'm not going to worry too much about copying that. The next thing they do is they make a variable for the transitions. So I'm going to pull those into my project. And I guess we can just fix the indentation of this. Uh, and then the next thing I wanna do is I'm actually gonna need to change this variable here, show, because my variable is show menu and that should fix that problem. And now what we need to do is take a look at the return statement. So I'm gonna copy this and we can paste this in here. Uh, but what they're doing is they're returning a bunch of animated divs. Now we actually want all of this code, but we want it inside of our current navigation. So I'm gonna take the transition and we're just gonna cut that out and we'll open up some brackets down here and paste that in. And then fix the indentation a little bit and we'll get rid of that return statement. Okay, so hopefully when I click my menu now, I get a little peace sign that fades in and out. It's small, but it's there and it works. So what I'd like to do now is instead of using this animated div with the peace sign, we can get rid of that. And I'm gonna break this down a little bit. So we'll just organize my JSX. 
And now for my menu, what I'll do is I'll grab that CSS that we're saving and I'll paste that in here. And then I'm just going to add in some text to say this is the menu. And now when I click on my menu, we should have this menu fading in and fading out. So that's kind of what I'm going for, except I'd like this to slide in and out. So we're gonna uh, manage that by changing the transitions. Although I think the fade works perfectly for our black background that should go in behind the menu. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna copy this down or up. And so this first transition is gonna be our black background and that was our mask. So I'm just going to take that class and paste that up here and we can get rid of this. So this is just gonna be an empty black background that fades in and out. So uh, now when I click on this, you can see that black background fades in as well as our menu. Uh, and of course it's not closing anymore. So what I'd like to do is add in an on-click listener down here just to say that this should close. So it's going to be an arrow function and this should set show menu to false. And it should always set show menu to false because it should always be closing the menu. It should never be opening the menu. So now uh, that fades in and if I click on it, it also closes the menu. Now what we should do is probably look at changing those transitions so we can get rid of these comments. And I'm going to make a mask transitions for our mask and we're going to apply those mask transitions here. And so this is actually just an array map. Hopefully you're a little bit familiar with JavaScript and you know how mapping arrays works. And then the next thing we wanna do is copy this constant down and this will be the menu transitions and we're going to copy that variable name and we'll paste that here. And so we'll loop through the variable transitions, except now what we wanna do is change the from and leave and opacity. So I've already prepared a bunch of transitions that I'm just going to paste in. Uh, what this does is it'll go from opacity zero and then also transform it from negative 100 on the X axis to opacity one and also transform it to 0% on the X axis, meaning that this should slide in from the X axis or from the left hand side of the screen. Uh, so now if we come back over to our menu and we open that up, you can see that the menu slides in and slides out. Perfect. Now all we need to do is add in a few finishing touches. So what I'm gonna do is just go down to the menu over here and let's also give that some padding and then we'll maybe add in a span tag with a bit of a heading or just something that says this is the menu. And then we can also add in an unordered list with uh, some list items like the home page, and that should pretty much be it. So if we open up the menu, uh, whoops, we've got some typos there. So this should be the menu, and I also want that to have a class name of font bold. So now if we open this up, we have a menu. Now let's use React Router to change the content on our page and also to change the URL up here in the browser without actually refreshing the page. So if I take a look at the menu over here, if we open this up, we can go to the about page and there's some new content and the URL has changed. And if I go over to the home page, there's different content and the URL has changed back to the home page URL. So you'll notice that all of this is happening without our web page having to refresh. Starting with the code from the previous tutorial, I'm going to add React Router to our project. So let's jump over to the terminal and I'll yarn add React Router DOM. So the reason why there is a React Router DOM is because React actually has two packages. There's React Router DOM, for websites and then React Router Native for native apps. Uh, they work slightly differently, but you use the DOM version for a web app. 
Now that we've got the package added to our project, we can go ahead and import that into app.js and take a look at how this works. Now, right off the bat, there's actually quite a few things to import. So I'm just gonna paste these imports in and you can see that we're importing browser router as router. So this is just a nice little shortcut to allow us to use the router element like this instead of having to type out browser router. Then we've got switches, routes, and links. But let's take a look at links first because a link is obviously gonna link us to another page. So what I wanna do is maybe let's create an unordered list over here and then a list item and then we'll create a link. And this link takes in a prop which is the page that we want to link to. So that prop is called to and then we can simply add in a URL over here. So if we wanted this to link to the home page, then we'll just add in a slash and we'll create the link for the home page. We can also add some styles to this by using the class name prop and adding in a class name. So I'm going to say text blue 500, which is a tailwind class. So if I save this now, uh, everything should error out and that's because we're making use of this link tag outside of a router. So there's a very specific way we have to go about doing things when working with React Router and one of those is to make sure that our list is always within the router like that or our links always within the router like that. So now I have a link that links me to the home page. So obviously that's nothing special because we only have a home page at the moment. So let's go ahead and add in another link and we'll make this one link to about and then we'll change the text over here to about as well. So now if I click on the about page, you can see that the URL changes up here in the top of the browser and switching back to home, that changes the URL again. So we've got a home page and we've got an about page. But you'll notice that none of the content on the page changes whenever the route changes. So that's actually what switches and routes are for. So let's take a look at how to use those. And what I'm gonna do is just below my list here, we're gonna open up a switch tag. And inside of this switch tag, we are going to place a few routes. So let's create a route for the home page, And this route is going to take in a prop called path. And we're gonna set that equal to a string of slash for the home page, And then we're going to do the exact same thing for the about page, but the path for the about page is of course slash about. So what's happening here is our switch is going to look for a route that matches this path and then display the content within that route. So let's break this down and inside the uh, homepage route, we can create an H1. I'm gonna copy that heading down and we'll make another heading like that for the about page. So if we save this and we take a look at this in the browser, and we switch between pages, you'll notice that the home page is now the only uh, content that's actually showing no matter what page we're on. So the reason for this is because the slash route over here will always match every other route in our app. So that's just the way React Router works unless you decide to say, hey, I only want this route to display if this is an exact match for the home page. So you just need to add in the exact prop here and then this will mean that the route on the content for the home page will only ever show on the home page. So now taking a look at this in the browser, if we go to the home page, we've got the home page content. And if we go to the about page, we have the about page content. Now let's take a look at moving this menu into our menu component instead of having that display in the body of our page. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna take this unordered list and we're going to paste that into our navigation file over the list that we previously had. And I'm just gonna fix the indentation here a little. But now if I save this, you can see that we've got link is undefined. So we just need to make sure that we are using this import 
in our navigation at the top of the page over here, but we don't need any of the other stuff. We only need the link. And if we save this now, uh, we'll probably get another error when we open our menu, and that is that the link shouldn't be used outside of a router tag. And that's because if we go back to app.js, uh, our links are in our header components. So what we need to do is we just need to take all of the content outside of that router tag, and let's place that within the router. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing for my footer as well. So let's place that within the router as well. And so now if we save, this should now be working. So we can open up our menu, but now we've got another issue where when we change to the home page, the URL changes. And if I close the menu, I can see that I'm actually on the home page. And if I go to the about page, the URL changes. And if I close the menu, I can see that I'm on the about page, but the menu isn't closing, right? You'd expect that when you click on the link that the menu should actually close by itself. So what we need to do here is go back over to your navigation and go over to each one of these links. And let's actually just break this down a little bit so it's gonna be easier to read. And what we wanna do is we'll get, we're gonna add in an on-click listener on each one of these links. So we'll add in an on-click listener and we'll set this equal to a JavaScript arrow function. And this will set show menu to false. So that will close the menu. And we're gonna do the exact same thing for all of the other menu items within our menu. But we can actually clean this up a little bit more because you'll notice that uh, this file is actually getting kind of long, this navigation file. And this menu is actually all located in a bunch of menu transitions and other JavaScript. And so to simplify this for the next developer who wants to just simply add a menu item, we can take this entire menu and we can put that in another component. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new uh, file and we'll call that navigationmenu.js and we'll simply add that as an export. So now we can actually import this navigation menu into our navigation file. So what I'm gonna do is let's just uh, go up to the top here and import navigation menu from dot slash navigation menu. And we can make use of that down here. Uh, great, so we've got link is not defined again. That's because we're not using this import over here anymore. We're actually making use of that in React Navigation menu. And so now you can see that this file is actually looking a lot cleaner, a lot simpler. If somebody wants to change a menu item, all they need to do is go over to Navigation menu and they can see that there's just a unordered list with a bunch of list items and if they wanted to, could, they could copy one down and add a new menu item whenever they felt like it. So this is obviously a lot cleaner to work with for anybody else who starts using our app. But uh, now you'll notice that we've got this next problem, which is that set show menu isn't defined. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to fire a hook or a setter from the navigation menu component. So what we need to do here is we can simply pass this in as a prop. So on click, what do I wanna do? I want the menu to close. So let's accept some props here. And on the click of this, we'll uh, pass in props.close menu, which is a prop that currently doesn't exist, but we'll paste this in here and we can go back over to navigation menu. And on our navigation menu, we can simply add the close menu prop and set that equal to some JavaScript. And the JavaScript that we're gonna set that equal to 
is the arrow function of set show menu to false. So what we're eff effectively doing here is we're passing this function down to our child component, our navigation menu component. And now when we open up our menu and click on the about page, that should still close the menu and clicking on the home page should still close the menu. And now we can probably just add in a few finishing touches. So on our link, I'm going to add in a padding on the Y axis of three. I'm also going to add in a border on the top and a border on the bottom. And then I'm also going to, I, actually, you know what? I think that's it. I think I'll take this class and just copy that to my about and we can get rid of the border on the top because that might duplicate borders. But now if I open up my menu, ah, I see uh, we've got the borders, but it's kind of displaying in text. So let's change the div or the span up here to a div. And then we can also make sure that these uh, links are displayed as block level elements. So I'm just gonna add in a block class and that should create a little bit of spacing. So we've got now spacing and borders. I think the next thing we wanna do is maybe on the menu here, add in the same padding on the Y axis of three and uh, that's looking a lot better. And we can probably just change this to app name as well. As a final finishing touch, we can take care of the content within the main view of our file. So what I'm gonna do is go over to app.js and we're gonna clean all of this up a little bit. So let's create a new folder and I'm gonna call that folder views and this will hold all of our views. So what I'm gonna do is create a new file for the homepage content and we'll call that home.js. And then I'm going to create another new file for the about page content and we'll call that about JS. And these are of course just gonna use some standard React boilerplate. So I'm gonna just copy that boilerplate over to the home page, and we've just gotta change the function name and the export name as well. So now that I've got these two files, I can import those into my app. And I think just to tidy things up a little bit, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the browser import to the top of the page over there, and then we'll create another import for our home page, And that'll be imported from views home. And then we'll duplicate that down and we'll import about from the about view. And now, we can take this heading for the home page and paste that in on our actual home page content. And we can do the exact same thing for this about page heading and paste that in on the about page content. And in fact, if we wanted a little bit more information on the uh, about page, all of that JSX can go over here and maybe just put in a margin on the bottom of that heading. And then we'll do the same thing for the home page. But what I'll do is I'll take the hello world component that is actually on our app.js file at the moment, and we'll paste that in in the home page, and we'll make use of that hello world component down here. So let's save these. And now let's go back over to our app.js file. And inside the home route, we'll use the home component or the home view. And inside the about page, we'll use the about component or well, the about view. And so now you can see I've got an error here, home JS module cannot resolve components, hello world. So that's just because the path is now changed relative to the hello world component. So it's actually got to go to dot dot slash components in hello world. Great. So Taking a look at this now, we've got the home page content and we've got the about page content. And I just want to add in a little bit of padding around the container there. So I'm going to take this entire switch and I'm going to create a div that I'll place that inside of. And this can have a class of P3 or P-3. And that will fix up the spacing a little bit. 
So what that all means is now anytime we want to create a new page for our site, we can simply copy one of these routes down, add in a new path for let's say the contact us page, and then we can create a contact us view and import that contact us uh, view down here. And that's as easy as it is to create a new page in our React app. But for now, that's where I'm gonna end this video. In this video, we're gonna take a look at sending an HTTP request to an API to fetch data and display that on our page. So if I give this a refresh, you'll notice that we have a little loading symbol and then the data loads in from this HTTP request. You can see that in the network tab in Google Chrome. And in fact, we can see a better example of this if we simulate slow 3G and load this again. So you'll notice that it takes a little bit longer, but we have the loading symbol and then we have our data loading into the page. We'll also be looking at dynamic route parameters to make this happen. So if I were to load product four, then we'll have a completely different product loaded in. Now, before you can follow along with this tutorial, you're going to need to have a JSON API that you can connect to and fetch all of the JSON data. So if you wanna learn how to create your own API, I do have a complete tutorial series on how to do this with Laravel, and that is a free course. So I will link to that in the video description of this video, go ahead and take a look at it. And you'll learn how to uh, create an entire project that will return any data you like. And of course you'll be able to store data, etc. But for the purpose of this tutorial and keeping this tutorial accessible to everyone, I'm going to show you a great free resource, which is called mock API. And what this allows you to do is set up a bunch of mock APIs. In fact, you only have uh, one free one, but that's fine. That's perfect for this video. And what I'm gonna do is log in and let me show you the API that I've set up for this video. So I've just set up a product list with a bunch of products and those products have some images. Now, if I take a look at my data, I think let's click the edit button there. Uh, this is the setup that I have for this tutorial. So I've got products and we can get products with a specific ID by adding that to the URL. We've also got post, put and delete requests if we wanna uh, put some more data, like edit data in the database and delete data from our database. Then these are the columns that I have on my API. So we've got an ID, we've got created at, we've got a name, a material that the product is made out of, a price, and all of these are generated with fakeJS. So it's just generating fake names for us and fake prices. And then we also have a uh, images resource, which is a child resource and that is just this resource down here. So if we were to take a look at a specific product in our database, uh, we can visit API v1 products and then the ID of that product being four or let's just say, let's look at the third product. Uh, and this is the data that we have returned. Now that you have an API to connect to, the next thing we're gonna do is open up a new file. So I'm gonna create a new file called product.js and this is going to be the product page for our app. And I'm just gonna paste in some standard React boilerplate code here. And the next thing I wanna do is head over to app.js and add that product page over here. So we'll add that in and this is going to import the product component. So we just need to make sure that we import that over here as well. And so now let's just change the path. So we're going to access this uh, product by accessing the URL products. And then we're going to add in a wildcard to the URL by adding a colon and then the name of the wildcard that we're passing through, which in this case is going to be an ID. And if we save this now, we should be able to access our product on the products URL and then adding a ID to the, to the URL as well. So ID three, ID two, whatever. And that should give us back the product page. Of course, we don't know we're on the product page just yet. So let's add in an H1 just to say uh, that this is the product page. And of course, now we know we're there. 
Uh, so we're going to be looking at replacing this data with the actual name of the product as the heading. Uh, but in order to do that, we first need to send through a request to our API to fetch all of this data. In order to send that request, we're going to make use of an HTTP library called Axios, which is just a yarn package. So we can copy that uh, command and we can come over to our terminal and yarn add Axios. And now that you have Axios in your project, you can go over to the file you want to use this in and import Axios from Axios. And what we'll do is we'll use Axios to send through one of the HTTP requests. So you can use Axios to get, to post, to delete, or any one of the different types of requests available. Uh, but in this case, because we want to fetch data from our API, we're going to be making use of a get request. And this get request takes in a URL. So what we want to do is we want to take in this URL and we're going to paste that in here. Of course, to clean things up a little bit, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a constant and uh, this constant will be a URL and we'll set that equal to the string version of our URL up here. Uh, so let's maybe just close that so we can see that a bit better. But that is the uh, variable. And so now uh, what we want to do is Axios get that URL. And once we've got that URL, this is actually going to return a promise. So we can chain on a then function. And this then function can uh, give us back the response from that request. And we'll run a function on that response. And on that response, we are going to set a variable. So what I actually want to do is I want to create another state variable up here. So we'll call this uh, const uh, product. So we'll create a product variable and then we'll create a method for setting that product called set product. And we're going to set this equal to the use state function from uh, React. And we'll default this to null. So by default, our product will be null. But once we've sent through this Axios request, we're going to set product to the response dot data. So we're going to get the response data from our request. So if I save this now and go back over to our project, uh, you'll notice that we could, uh, well, first of all, you'll notice in the network tab, seeing as I have that open, uh, we are sending through a request every single second. And this is going to get a bit much. Of course, you don't want to <laughs> be doing this. So this is a massive bug. But the reason why this happens is because we're making use of this Axios request inside of our product function. So what we need to do is we actually need to cut that out. And we need to make use of that inside of another React hook called use effect. So I'm going to add that to my project. And we're going to make sure that that's imported up here. And then we are going to set this to an arrow function. So uh, this arrow fun or this um, hook actually takes in two arguments. The first one is a function of code that we want to run. And then the second argument is uh, a variable that we want to monitor. And if that variable ever changes, then that's what we want to use to rerun the request. So for now, we can add in the URL in here. And so now if this URL changes, that's when the code within the effect will rerun. So what we'll do is we'll paste in our Axios request here. And when we save this now, we should have our network request only running once. And we should have this uh, set product, or we should have this data in set product. So I can try output that in my template down here by outputting the product name. And of course, if I save this now, we have a huge error, cannot get property name of undefined. And that's because our product first loads in as null, and we're going to return a template that's trying to use the product name. So what we need to do in order to get around this is we can create an if statement to check if there is actually uh, a value in product, to check that there's actually data there, and then return our product name. And then we can also have a default return down here of uh, 
just an empty div. So we can grab this and paste that in, but remove the heading with that data in it. So you'll notice that when I uh, actually save this now and we refresh, there is a brief second in which there is no data and then we have the product name output. So we've got this template first and then we actually have this template. Another way to get around that is to also just create a variable called content. So we can say let content equal null and then we can output that content variable down here. But in the if statement, we could uh, change content to be the, uh, the content that we wanted to return, which in that case was actually the uh, div with the heading that I wanted to output. So in fact, let's actually just grab, well, yeah, let's grab the entire heading and change that variable to be this. Okay, and that basically does the same thing. Now we can access the rest of our product data and create a little template. And what I've done is I've already prepared a little template for us. So I'm gonna just paste in that JSX. And the way I'm getting all of these uh, variables is if we take a look at the request over here, you can see we've got an ID, a name, a material, a price. So these are all things that I can access. And in case of the images, this is actually an array. So what I'm doing is I'm just getting the first image in that array and then getting the image URL on that uh, image. And if we look at that in the data, I'm actually just returning a Pixum image, which returns a random image every single time. Uh, so uh, whenever I save this template now, uh, we should have uh, our product and then we should have a random image. And every time I load the page, of course, that will return a different image. Now, the next thing we wanna do is we actually wanna look at making this dynamic because the problem is, whenever I access this uh, product URL, it doesn't matter if I'm using the ID of one or the ID of four, I'm always getting the same handmade granite t-shirt and that's because we've hard coded that ID over here into the URL. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna create another constant and we will call this the ID. And in fact, we're gonna make use of JavaScript destructuring. So I'm going to uh, create a variable here called ID. And I'm gonna set this equal to uh, another hook, which is called use params. And that is a hook that we get from the React router DOM. And what this allows us to do is, uh, well, it will just return all of the uh, URL parameters up here. And in this case, it will give us that ID. So we'll get just the ID from those params. And now we can make use of that ID over here at the end of our string. So I'm going to uh, paste in a little dollar sign ID, but then we need to surround the rest of our string with back ticks instead of quotation marks. And so that will allow us to use a variable in the string. So if we save this now, we should be able to have a dynamic uh, variable in the string in the URL. So if I go to product two, I should have a handmade soft tuner. If I go to product one, I've got a different product, which is awesome soft chips. And if I go to product five, well, I have gorgeous cotton pizza. So uh, we're now getting a dynamic product every time we change the URL. Now let's take a look at creating a loading symbol for while our data is loading into the app. So taking a look at what we currently have, if we click the refresh button, there is currently a very small portion of time where we could be displaying a loader. And I think let's just simulate 3G. Uh, so we're just imitating somebody else's mobile device. Uh, maybe they have a very slow internet connection. You'll notice that when our app first loads in, the initial paint happens and then we've got this period where it's blank for a good like one second or two seconds where we could actually be displaying a loader. So from here until here, there could be a loading symbol just to let the user know, hey, we're actually sending an API request and something's going on in the background, but the data that should be displaying on the page will be displaying soon. So let's change that back to being online. 
And now let's take a look at how to track whether the API request is currently loading or not. What we could do is we could just turn this current state variable into an object. So now let's create a variable for loading and we'll set that equal to be false by default. And then we'll also create data and we'll set that to be null by default. And so now when we, before we fetch our product, we'll set loading to be true. And then we'll store all of the data for our product in data. So in order to do that, we're just going to have to modify this method a little bit. So before I send my request, what I actually want to do here is I want to change state so that we have a value of loading to be true. And then we want to have a value of data or whatever's in our data value to be null, right? And then when we send through the request and we know that that request is successful, we're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to set loading back to false because now uh, the app has done loading, the request is finished, and we're going to store response.data in the data variable. Now, of course, if I save this, we should break our app. And that's because uh, we cannot read property undefined of uh, zero or property zero of undefined. So that's because this now needs to be changed to be product.data. And we're gonna have to change all of the other references to the product information. So let's just paste all of them in. And of course, on, in our if statement, let's check for product.data, right? So let's save that now. And we have a working app again, but we still don't have that loading symbol showing up. So what do we wanna do now? I think what we should do is create an if statement here. So let's create an if statement and we'll check for if product.loading is equal to true. And if product.loading is uh, equal to true, then we'll change content, the content for our app, to be a paragraph and this can just say loading for now. So now if we save this, uh, you can actually see that that's appearing. There's a brief second where we have loading and then our product loads in. So it's probably a lot better if we change this to use a loading component. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up an, uh, my editor here and we're gonna open up a new file. We'll call that loader dot js and that needs to have a capital L and now we can paste in some HTML for a loader. So all I've done here is I've created a div with a class of loader and now we actually need to add this to our CSS. So one way we can do this is to just go over to index CSS and add in any of our own custom CSS under the tailwind utilities. And I'm gonna paste in this loading class, which also has some keyframes to make it spin. And this is just a free loader that I got off the internet. Uh, you can actually uh, Google loading CSS loader and you'll find plenty of different CSS uh, loading examples. So now if I save this, uh, I'm gonna have to go back over to my terminal and let's just kill my server and start my server again, which will run the build CSS. And instead of placing this loading paragraph here, I can now make use of my loading component that we created. So let's open that up. Or what did I call it? Loader, right? And uh, that needs to be imported over here. So great, so now we have a little CSS loader that is loading into the page. Now something we haven't quite thought about yet is what happens if there is an error? So let's try and access a product that doesn't exist, like for example, product 90. Well, now that product doesn't exist and I can see in my network request that we've actually got an error here, so this is not found, but we haven't treated that error in our app. So now we just have this loading symbol that continues to load forever. So let's take a look at how to track this error. So what I'm gonna do is in my state variables, let's add in an error to monitor when there is an error. 
But by default, we're going to set that to false. And then we're also going to copy that and we'll paste that here in set product. So before we send through our request, we also want our error to be false. And when our request goes through and is successful, we can have that error also be false because we know that this means that the response was uh, successful. So we don't actually have any errors, but uh, because Axios is a promise based library, we can make use of a catch statement here because we can catch a failed promise and we are going to then have an error from our API and we can run a function on that error and then also do the same thing here, set product. But in this case, we won't have any data because we're not getting a good response from the API. So uh, our data will be null. And now we can set our error to be true. Now, normally what I do here is I would try and use the data that came back from our API and save that and report that to the user. Unfortunately, if we uh, take a look at this, like let's access product 90 here. This API is just returning not found. It's not giving us any usable data. It's not even uh, supplying this as a JSON object. So unfortunately the error reporting on this API is not that great, but uh, we can just use uh, error set to true. And so in fact, we can probably just use an arrow function instead of the word error over there or the uh, response of error over there. Okay. So now we should know when our um, variable or whenever our product has an error. So if we go back over to our app, let's come back here and refresh again. And you'll see that that loading symbol doesn't continue loading forever. Uh, and we do have an error here. And if we were to check our state, in fact, let's actually do that now. Let's go to our components and find the product component. In our state, we should have an error value of true over there. So what we can do now is add in another if statement. So we've already checked for if loading and we've already checked if the product actually has data, but we can also create another if statement here to check if there is an error and then we can just return a little bit of HTML if there was an error. So in this case, I'm going to just return a, a paragraph that says there was an error. Please refresh or try again later, something like that, right? So now if the response uh, fails, we at least have an error that can be uh, reported back to the user. Of course, the better your API can handle errors in the back end, you could report a 404 or say that the product doesn't exist. In this case, we don't really have much data to work with uh, from the API. It's not giving us anything except for not found. So that not so great, but uh, at least we can handle it this way. Now let's take a look at fetching an entire list of products. And I know these pictures are the same, but we do have different titles. We've got awesome soft chips and handmade soft tuna. The prices are different. Uh, but what we're gonna do is fetch a list of products and then have those link through to the product page. And when we go back to the home page, we fetch the list again. So in order to get a list of products, if we go back over to mock API, we access that with the slash products URL. So I've actually got that open in my browser over here. So uh, I've actually also added some string queries here, but the slash products URL will give us a list of all of our products unpaginated with no limits. So there's just a lot of products here. Now you might want to actually limit this. So I'm going to add in these two string queries, which is page is equal to one and limit is equal to 10. And that will give us 10 products on the first page. So now we should have 10 of these products. And if I want to go to page two, then I just change the pagination up here to page two, page three, etc., And that will give us the next page of products. So we've actually got a URL that we can paginate with. So now what I'm going to do is let's open up our home page. And I'm going to replace some of the content that's in here. Uh, the first thing we want to do is maybe make this title a little more, more product friendly. So I'm going to jump back over to my app 
and let's change the title here to be something like best sellers and that obviously is a little bit more related to products so we'll get a list of our best sellers 10 of our best sellers and then we can remove the uh, hello world component because we're not going to need that anymore but we are going to make use of some dynamic content, something similar to what we have on the product page. So let's actually open that up and we can probably compare some of the differences here, but you can see that we created let content equals null. And depending on what state our Axios request was in, we actually changed the content and output that on the page. So we're gonna do the same thing for our home page, right? We're going to output a variable called content down here and then we can dynamically change that. So I'm going to just declare that up here as well. So let content equal null, and that should still keep working. We've just got a title with no content on our page. So the next thing we wanna do is we actually wanna reuse a lot of what we've got on the product page because we wanna send through an Axios request and fetch all of that data. So what I'm gonna do is let's copy what we have on the product page. I'm going to just copy all of this stuff down and we're going to get a bunch of errors here. So we're going to have to work, work through all of those as we go. But I also want to use the use effects because we want to send through an Axios request. So let's also pull that in. And now because we're actually using this twice in two different places, it might make sense to extract this out to one place where we can reuse it. But we'll take a look at doing that in a couple minutes. Let's just get this working for now. So if I hit save, you'll notice that I get a couple errors. So we've got use params is not defined and that's because we're using a URL parameter up here, but our homepage doesn't have any URL parameters. So let's get rid of that line. And if we save this now, we'll still have a couple more errors. So ID is not defined. We're actually gonna be using a completely different URL. We're gonna be using this URL over here to get a list of products. So let's actually paste this in and that will get rid of that error. Uh, then we've got use effect, use state and Axios are not defined. So let's go back over to our product page and we'll import these two lines and we can actually just paste that over here. So we've got react, use state, use effect and Axios, all three of those. So now if we save, hey, no more errors but we have also sent through a network request to the products page. And we can probably take a look at that. So we've gone to products with a page of one and a limit of 10, and that's given us these 10 products over here. So if we wanna take a deeper look into that, we've got an array of 10 items, and each one of these items has got the product specific information. So now we can actually use that information. Now we can start taking a look at outputting this data and then we will clean up our component. So the first thing I wanna do is let's change the const here because we're actually going to be looping through an array of products. We're no longer getting one product, we're getting more than one product. So it's gonna be products and then we'll change the method here to be set products and of course we'll change it uh, everywhere where we're using it. So set products, set products, and set products. So if we save this now, uh, that should still continue working. Then the next thing we wanna do is, again, borrow a little bit more uh, content from the product page. So the first thing I wanna do is check if there are some products, and if there aren't, we or if the products have an error, and we're also gonna borrow the loading. So if, if the products are currently loading, let's output something. So let's take that content and paste that down here below where we've actually declared content. And let's just check for products.error and products.loading. So if I save this now, uh, okay, we have an error. Loading is not defined. So we just need to make sure that we import loader from uh, dot slash was it dot dot slash components and loader. Okay, so now we actually have our loader appearing just fine and we should also have an error appearing just fine if we maybe uh, put in the wrong URL. So our error still works as well. Great. So now we know that these two work. Let's take a look at actually getting the content. So the last thing we'll do is take a look at the products.data check and we'll paste that down here 
And we're obviously also going to check if products has data. And if it does have data, uh, for now, these aren't actually going to work. So if I save this, I should get an error. So product is not defined. That's because, well, we've got products there. But even if I were to change these names, they wouldn't work. So let's just output uh, there is, is some data. And of course, now we know that there's actually some data there. We want to loop through that data. So uh, instead of returning a div, let's map through products.data because we know that that is an array. So products.data.map. And then this will take in two arguments. The first argument is going to be the singular name for each item that we loop through, which is going to be product. And the second item is going to be the key. So that is actually our index of which current, which product we're currently on in the array. And then this will return some HTML or some JSX rather. So uh, what we can do here is then create a div and output the current product name. And that's going to have to be surrounded in curly braces. So we're getting that product from that product over there. And this product is a singular version of that product or that, that array of products. Great, so now we actually have a list of all of our product's names. The next thing we want to do is actually create a nice little template for this. And I think the best thing to actually do for this is to just create a product card. So let's open up our uh, files here and in components, let's create a new file and we'll call that product card.js. And so this will actually return a card of our products. And of course, now all I need to do is paste in some standard React boilerplate code for creating a component. And if we save this, we can go back over to the home page and I can replace this with my actual component. So let's import that. Hopefully it's imported up here. And now we can close that off. And what I want to do is I actually want to accept in some props. So we're going to pass the product in as a prop and then start displaying all that data down here. So we can go back over to the home page and let's pass in a product prop and that will be the current product that we are on. And if we save this, we can go back over to product card and we can start outputting some of that data. So if I access props dot product dot name, I can also access um, props.product.price and that should output the name and the price. So now let's actually format this and I'm going to quickly just paste in a little bit of code one by one and I'll explain as I go along. But the first thing I want to do is return a div with a border and it's going to have some rounded corners and it's going to have overflow hidden. It'll also have a margin bottom on the, the bottom of the card. The next thing I want to do is I actually want to output a product image and I'm going to use a background image. So let's just paste this in and you'll see that we're making use of a style attribute here and this is taking in an object, which is why there's double curly braces and we're passing through a background image. So that's the background image CSS property as an object and we're then supplying in a URL but we're making use of backticks here so that we can use variables in a string. And in this case, we're just passing in the first image within the product images array. So saving this then gives us a background image that should load in and that has rounded corners. The next thing I want to do is I actually want this uh, div to be a link that will link us to the product page. So what I'm going to do is just paste that in. And so now this is going to link us to the product page, supplying the uh, argument of the product's ID up here in the URL. And again, we're making use of backticks so that we can pass a variable as a string in JavaScript. So saving this now will result in an error. So what we need to do is import link from React Router DOM. And so now 
this image should actually be a link. If we uh, click on it, it should take us through to the product page. So the second Im image took us to product two. And if we go back over to one of these other images down here, that takes us to product four. Uh, the next thing you'll notice is now that we can actually scroll, my footer is scrolling up the page. So we'll take a look at fixing that towards the end of the video. Uh, but for now, let's continue just fixing this card. So the next thing I wanna do is uh, we will create a div with a padding of three. And so that's going to house the rest of our product content. So the first thing I wanna do is paste in the product's heading and that's got some CSS classes just to make it bold and large. And then we're linking to the same link that we have up here, which is just to the product page with the argument of the product ID. We've also got the product name in the heading. The next thing we're gonna do is add in the price below that heading. Let's just indent that. And then the last thing I wanna do, or second last thing I wanna do is add in the product description. So saving this now should give us a title, a price, and a description. And then I think uh, we can also add in a button at the bottom of our card. So this is just going to be a link with a few classes to make it look like a button, and it's going to have the text view. So if we save that now, we have a card that when we click on the view button, takes us through to the product page. So now if we take a look at the console, you'll notice that we have list should have a unique key. So there's a warning in the console here. And that's just because whenever you work with an, a loop in React and you're looping through elements, the top level element needs to have a key so that React can identify that element and when to re-render that element. So what we wanna do is just add in a key and we can set that equal to key. In this case, that is the index of our array. We could also get rid of that key itself and just use the product.id as the key instead. And saving that will get rid of that error. And so now uh, we don't have any errors there, but we still have this weird issue with the footer. So let's fix that. And I think in order to do that, we're just gonna have to open up app.js. And the reason why this ha is happening is because that footer actually has a class of absolute. So it's positioned absolutely at the bottom of the screen. So what we wanna do is fix it by taking the parent element of the footer, which is also the parent level element of our app. And we are going to add in a class of relative and that should make the footer display all the way down at the bottom of the page. But now you'll notice there's a bit of a spacing issue there. So we're going to give that a class of PB10 for padding bottom 10, and that should fix the uh, spacing issue. So now we've actually got a bit of space between this last card and the footer. But if we go to the product page now, the footer doesn't display at the bottom of the page anymore. And that's because this app should probably just be a minimum height of the screen. So there is a class for that in React called min h screen. And that will push that down to the bottom. But again, if we go back over to the home page, um, the foot is still down there. It's not scrolling with our content. So that was one little finishing touch. I think in the next video, we will take a look at cleaning up some of the code over here. So we will make it that we're not repeating the use effect uh, in both the home page and the product page because that's quite a lot of code to be reusing. Now let's learn how to make our own hooks in React and demonstrate how that can clean up your code. So if we take a look at my home page, you can see that we've got some state and then we've also got use effect down here. And this is pretty much word for word, the exact same code that's on my product page. And we have the state and then we have use effect. So the only thing that's really changed here is the name of the variable. So I think what we can do is extract this out to a hook and make that reusable between these two pages. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new folder in the source directory, and we're gonna call that hooks. And then inside of hooks, we're gonna create a new file and we'll call that HTTP requests.js. And now we can create a hook. So we're going to import react from react 
and then we're going to declare a function and it's kind of important that the function is named with the keyword use in front of it. And that's just a React standard uh, so that React knows that this is actually a hook. So we'll say use Axios get as the function name and then we can finish that off. And what we could do is down at the bottom here, export use Axios get or we could just place the keyword in front of the function over here. So we can just say export function use Axios get, same thing. And now what we wanna do is paste in all of the code that we've been repeating. So let's go over the home page and let's grab the state and we'll paste that in here. And then we can go over to the use effect thing and we can copy all of that and paste that in here as well. So now we actually need to import these because we've got use effect and use state. And if I try to run this file, then we would get a error on both of those. So let's import them. So now that those have been imported, we can cut this code out of our homepage. So let's actually just remove all of that. And let's take a look at how to use our custom hook. So what we wanna do is we actually want to get a value out of this custom hook. So what we wanna do down here is make sure that this is returning something. So let's return the name of the a state that we've created. In this case, it's products, but I think we're gonna change that name pretty soon. So let's return that down here. And then in the home page, what we'll do is we'll create a variable here called products, and this can be a constant. Well, actually let's call it a let, and we'll let products equal whatever's returned from our hook. So let's use use axios get make sure that that's actually imported over here. And that will then take in an argument because remember we've got this URL up here that we still need to pass in to our Axios request. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass that URL like this. And then we're gonna go over to our HTTP request and we're gonna just accept that URL here and we're already using that down here. So that's fine. So if we save this and then when we save our home page. Oh damn, use Axios is not defined. So we just need to make sure that we take that import and put it in HTTP requests. And boom, okay, everything seems to be working, but now we're actually using that with a hook. So now whenever we want to send through a request, all we need to do is add in this one line of code and that will take care of our state for us. It will take care of the Axios import for us and everything. So we can go over to product and we can do the exact same thing. Let's remove that code and let's remove the effect down here. And now we can create a variable called product and that can come from this URL up there. So if we save this now, whoops, okay, use Axios is not defined. So we just need to make sure that we actually import that. Boom, okay, it's there. So now when we go to the specific product page, that still works. Uh, but again, we're now doing that with just one line of code instead of the entire constant and the use effect. So now what we can do is we can actually change the variables here. So Let's not call this a product. What we're actually doing is we're sending through a request. So we can call that request. And then we can call this method set request. And then we can just change the name of that method here, here, and here. And then of course, when we export that out or return that out, we want to return what's in the request. So our request will either have loading data or an error and that still continues to work. But again, we've done it with just one line of code in here.